Welcome everyone for another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we have Jeffrey Frank in the house. He's a tech consultant and also um, vividly publishing within academia still. Um, yeah, the bio is in the is in the um sorry, don't know what the bio is in the show notes and the affiliated blog post. Um so yeah, you have a decade long experience in like working for tech, but also uh, like at the interface between tech and research. What is your view? First of all, thanks for, for making time for this, but yeah, and, and now we're here to hear from you. Um, your view on how research and technology and the tech industry may or may not work well with each other, how they both um, learn, like how, how the mutual learning happens or can be improved. Um, okay. How else to phrase this? So, so yeah, what what are the what are the well, benefits that, that research brings to the tech industry and vice versa, and where can we do better? I see the technologies that are based on science fewer coming out now than they did fifty years ago. So, mm -hmm. in the glory days of the forties, fifties, and sixties, you had integrated circuits and transistors and magnetic storage and nuclear power and uh, lasers. Uh, there was a very long list of technologies that came out uh, and that were uh, commercialized and have grown successfully over the last twentieth century, uh, growing very big, providing lots of employment for many kinds of people, providing lots of value for many kinds of people. But I see that slowing down. I see that less is coming out in the last 20 years. I see a few uh, exceptions like OLEDs, uh, but we don't see like nanotechnology or superconductors for uh, energy usage or quantum computers or even bioelectronics of the Theranos kind. So we see a lot less coming out. And uh, I think that's, that's a big issue because we the government governments have been spending a lot of money on this uh, and they want to spend more money. And I have a feeling that uh, that money is only going to give us more academic papers and not more technologies, which is what we want. Right. So um, and do you see reasons for that? Why is the uh, knowledge transfer not happening as efficiently as it used to? Well, I think that the whole way we do basic and applied research has changed dramatically in the last 70 years. Hmm. So the, the first big change is that corporate uh, corporations stopped doing started uh, uh, started doing less and less basic and applied research. And I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but uh, there, there's a big change. Uh, people like Ashish Arora at uh, Duke University have documented these changes, mm -hmm. uh, big reductions uh, in this basic and applied research for corporations. And part of that is because uh, universities started to do more of that basic applied research. So in the 1950s and 1960s, the government started to ramp up spending uh, and continued through after that. And so that is, provides less incentive for those companies to do it. Um, there's probably other reasons. They probably just weren't as successful at getting money from those that basic and applied research as they once were. Now, a, a second big thing is that universities have become obsessed with publishing papers. We see the number of papers published just has really increased over the last 40 years. And we think that's great. But the problem is, is that people don't read the papers. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times people make jokes, oh, it's only the author and uh, a reviewer that reads the paper, maybe the editor. Um, and that might you know, actually be look true, at, sadly, yeah. yeah. And if you look at data on it, uh, because there's ways to, to measure this, you find that it's mostly postdocs and uh, doctoral students that are reading these papers. So mm -hmm. the, the, the corporations that you want to be reading these papers really aren't reading them uh, because you want them to commercialize this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a second big change. A third big change is that we've had such an increase in the number of journals, uh, in the number of papers that we've increased the number of journals. If you want more papers, you have to publish more journals. We publish more journals. We have so many journals. For example, in Nature, only published one in 1970. Now it's like 150. You mm. see similar increases <coughs> in the number of journals for other you know, Mechanical Engineering Society, the uh, IEEE, I mean, the IEEE, mm. uh, Medical Society, American Medical Association, 
All these societies have just ramped up the number of journals they publish. Now, from their standpoint, this is really successful. This is great. We have all these journals we're publishing. We're doing lots of work. The problem is there's so many that they're very hyper-specialized. So it, 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 you look at them and it's so specialized, you begin to think, well, maybe these professors can't really come up with an idea that's mm -hmm. gonna be useful to people because they're so hyper-specialized. They're so into publishing something very, very narrow. You know, whole, you, know you, you look at what they, they know and it's this, push your fingers together. And what you want them to know, what you want them to teach, what you want them to develop, right? It's, it's, it's out there. Mm -hmm. And so that's the third reason I think that we're getting less out. The fourth is that we've created a huge bureaucracy to handle all of this, right? If you're gonna publish lots of papers and you're gonna hire, you're gonna have lots of PhD students, you're gonna hire lots of postdocs, uh, there's a, there's gonna be, you require a big bureaucracy to handle all this. I mean, just for example, peer review really did not exist until 1970. Before 1970, it was mostly editors and a few members of the society. Uh, so now we have this huge bureaucracy for peer review. Uh, it doesn't handle ha happen well because it doesn't work well because a lot of people don't like to, they, they have to review too many papers. They don't want to review papers. So it's all done by, mm -hmm. uh, postdocs and doctoral students who who really have better things to do they're more interested in publishing papers than they're reviewing papers mm -hmm. so th this whole bureaucracy i mean even these mundane things like somebody has to write uh recommendation letters for all these phd students for all these postdoctoral students these big lab uh people who run these labs they're administrators right back in the days when corporations did all this basic and applied research there was no, none of this bureaucracy, you know, Bell Labs and uh, uh, GE and IBM, where a lot of people did the work that led to a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So all of this bureaucracy, uh, it, it takes these scientists away from being scientists and turns them into administrators. It's a very big waste of talent. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of reasons I think they're involved here. Well, well, as you just said, like the bureaucracy or the system that we currently find ourselves in due to the publication pressure, I would, um, or as well as what I heard from you and what, what academics have become or are now very well aware of, led to the fact that scientists don't have the capacity anymore to focus enough of their time on actually doing research, what they signed up for, but rather having to deal with all kinds of paperwork, including peer review rather than yeah. doing their own research and focusing on that and doing yeah. slow science with less output, but more coherent presentation of the results, like more applicable yeah. also to other sectors. Yeah. Um, so now we have this open science or the push for open science on all stakeholder levels with the funders, um, researchers themselves find it difficult to implement because as you just pointed out, so. Um, so well, um, are overwhelmed by the administrative over overload and also wanting to be researchers and the um, first and foremost, um, struggling to do the, just that. And now they're being tasked with, okay, now you open up your research, like like be transparent, um, still be cautious with sensitive data. So you know, there's a whole lot of which they um, most researchers. I put my hand in fire like want to and, and do the best um possible to comply with but also like that's just too much pressure so do you see any ways out of this misery like do you have like is it like how can we pull back and uh, or not pull back or re like twist the system to make it work again for societies including the researchers well a lot of the pro the problems stem from the funding agencies right you need money Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't just for your time. Modern science requires a lot of money because equipment is expensive. So mm -hmm. this is another thing that's changed in the last 70 years is that modern labs require very expensive equipment. And so you have to get research grants to get that to get that that equipment. And a lot of times university researchers aren't very good at sharing their equipment with, with people. So universities may have tons of equipment that isn't utilized very much, but a lot of professors don't want to share it because they have, they're under pressure to publish. Mm. Um, so they need money from funding agencies. And funding agencies want to show that they're 
do that that they're they're giving money uh that re good research is coming out from that uh from their funding so what do they do well they say you got to publish papers you got to get patents the more papers you publish the more patents you get uh uh the more money we'll give you you know because that's the better that the not only the researchers look that makes the funding agencies look good so there's a lot of people here who are uh looking at everything superficial they want to have some that easy simple metric and they want to measure people in a simple way so they come up with well you got to publish papers and you got to uh get patents uh but the problem is is that that's not what we really want we really want science that leads to commercialization mm -hmm. that's a harder thing to measure and that's what some researchers would argue they want to prevent because they feel well publicly funded research is a political culture thing i'm also not buying into but like the fear of having the research output commercialized and then but as you say like that's exactly what we want we want to make the knowledge being applied to societal for societal benefits eventually yeah. um so do you feel like okay so i so one of the global challenges that we have first of all climate change but also that do you think technology could help us eat like to like also having now observed and witnessed for like five if not a decade long um how the political will seems to be there but does not implement like do you feel like technology could help us um, mitigate and not only mitigate but but really basically solve the issues that we're solving things like based on research uh, well i think i'm answering that already so if we now like how can we shift gears <laughs> Like, how, can we switch gears? how can we shift gears to to make the system work again to to be able to solve all these issues and and to well, convince politics that we have everything i think it's to be take. very hard because there isn't a political will right the right and the left both have their talking points they both have things they like to talk about and they think are the key to everything so the right believes in the market and so the the to the right everything technology is coming out because the free market's great it must be coming out because the free market is great. Free market works well, so there must be all these technologies coming out. And anybody that says otherwise, well, you must be a socialist. But then on the left, they want to say, well, we've got these great universities, these hardworking researchers. They're, they're doing great work. So something must be coming out. Mm -hmm. It can't be coming out. And don't talk about changing our, our universities. It's those people over there on those companies that are doing the bad things. Uh, and I think that most both groups are wrong. Both groups are focused on the wrong issues. They're not thinking about what does it take to do science and commercialize the science? What does it take to do those things? And do we have a system set up, up that makes that easy to do? And I, I wish the left and the right would focus on those things, but it's very hard. It's very hard. Is there like a group in between that could... Um rise up and facilitate such conversations to happen in the near future maybe the startup ecosystem like where where the entrepreneurs are still young fresh from university they start to understand the corporate world and maybe can can bridge and and what's mediate the conversations to happen maybe there are some examples of uh for example ellen moss doing things that none of the incumbent companies could do right? none of the auto companies uh, were able to 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 make these lithium ion battery batteries work. So there is an example of a of a startup, an outsider doing what none of the incumbent auto companies could do, whether they were from America, Japan, Germany, uh, France. Uh, you know, they, they, the incumbents couldn't do it, but Elon Musk could. But that's a, that's one exception. Uh, I think it's 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 going to be hard because if you look at startups in general, most are losing money. Ninety mm percent -hmm. of the publicly traded unicorn startups, unicorns are startups that were valued at a billion dollars before they went public. Ninety percent of them are losing money. Uh, very few. I mean, I think the the biggest success stories are Moderna and uh, uh, Airbnb. 
those mm -hmm. are the two biggest success stories. Uh, so you might look at a Moderna and say, okay, they, they commercialize these RNA vaccines. So that's a good example. And, and uh, as did Pfizer, um, and one of the, the, the I, I, I'm not going to pronounce her name, Carico. Uh, there's a woman who was very, who was very, uh, a corporate woman who was very important, um, very important part of this commercialization. She has been very critical of academia because she worked in academia for years and uh, she wasn't successful. They took away her lab. So she had to go to uh, work in corporate, doing corporate research. And then she managed to commercialize these mRNA vaccines. Mm. Uh, so she's very negative on ac academia. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Nature had an article, Nature had a few articles. Nature had three articles on this problem in January. The first article show, showed that there was less disruptive science being uh, done than in the past. Mm. Uh, so that was the first article. The second article is that they found that there were 9,000 researchers in the world who were publishing a paper every five days. Mm. And they weren't critical of the people, but it obviously raised a lot of eyebrows. It was like, why is this going on <laughs> every five days? How can somebody publish so many papers? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and the third paper they published was on uh the large number of uh academic scientists who were leaving to go to uh corporate research because they said they just couldn't get anything done in academia they had become scientists because they wanted to do something great for the world they wanted to develop science that ended up as useful products and processes and services mm -hmm. and it wasn't happening so they said i'm gonna quit academia uh, and so that's actually the article that I was thinking about when you asked the question, but I remembered the other two articles because those three articles came out in January, all very close to each other. Right. So what if we think academia to be an incubator to breed ideas, which then, I mean, this is probably already happening, sometimes, like oftentimes out of pain points, because hardly any PhD students realizes that they were eventually leave academia. First of all, there's not enough positions. There's too much competition for tenure. Um, but then there's so many opportunities outside academia. So maybe we have an overrated understanding. Maybe there's too much of a hype about academia. I mean, yes, we like we need the academic system for what it is good at, but not see it as a um, final destination for researchers to spend a lifetime at because that's not what it can possibly. Yeah, the serve problem it. is that corporate corporations are doing less basic and applied research. So that's been documented. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. Mm. Um, they're mostly moving to the D of the R and D, the development, doing less mm. of the basic and applied research. So we we want without that basic and applied research, then nothing new will come out not, not nothing new in the that's similar to integrated circuits or transistors or magnetic storage or lasers or uh, uh glass fiber you know all these things that really were important they, they're not going to come out and uh uh and even things like superconductors for energy transmission uh nuclear fusion these things these things involve still a lot of applied research mm -hmm. and so if corporations don't do these things, then you got to have academics do them. Or you find a way to get corporations to do them. I mean, there are ways to do this. You can give bigger R&D credit, credit, tax credits to corporations than we do now. You can uh, take some of the money that's going to academia and give it to uh, some type of laboratory alliances where you say, okay, we will, if, if five firms can create uh, uh, a laboratory that does basic and applied research cooperatively, uh, then we will put in as much money as you put in. Mm. And you can't develop any products there, but you can do the basic and applied research and then share it among the firms uh, and they can then commercialize it. So you can do these various things, but uh, no one's tried that yet. And uh, there will be a lot of resistance. There's a lot of resistance out there because there's a lot of academics who hate, as you mentioned earlier, hate the idea of corporations commercializing research. They kind of see it as all oh, those corporations are big and bad and uh, we shouldn't let them do this. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, right now they, they're getting a lot of uh, 
uh, evidence of that, right, from like AI and things and all the whole way that uh, social media is being run and people adding AI to that uh, upsets a lot of people. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some truth to the fact that corporations do this kind of uh, research that doesn't lead to good social, social outcomes. So there's going to be a lot of resistance from universities to giving more money to corporations to do basic and applied research. Yeah, or, or there is a lot of good things because I think we all appreciate that on Facebook we can track where our friends are based and how much global reach each of our yeah. individuals that was only possible through data mining and data scraping. Um, so we take the good stuff for granted and then are quick to criticize and also rightfully so, but then losing scope of the, the actual benefits that the same technologies also bring to society mm -hmm. and for wider adoption. But, and like, like I've come to the conclusion also with ChatGPT and the discussions around that and now with I forgot, I, I'm not as firm with the names that are also now coming along with Google and, and others, but um, these are just tools. And um, as I'm also operating or, or collaborating with colleagues in Africa, mostly, but also in other parts of the world, um, like I think it's important to have these conversations on a global scale, to have these conversations globally inclusive, to, to hear voices and and applica applicabilities around the world and yeah see and i think there's there's yeah we, we can have more of that always <laughs> but that's also happening um so what do you, what would you say researchers can do like what i'm trying to foster in my courses when i talk to early career researchers to to think again, and for some it might be a no-brainer, but to really look into the stakeholder analysis. Who is your research good for? Who might it benefit? Who might it harm, possibly? What, um, have you done any risk analysis? To what degree? Um, or, but yeah, again, like stakeholder analysis. Who do you need to communicate your research to? How can you package the information to make it applicable? It's this early stage as you're already like er, already at the stage where you're generating the data and then now being asked from the funders to um to share your data um in a fair manner, but also possibly openly, like an open access repositories. Um so I personally hope that researchers have a chance to to direct those conversations if they're only being sensitized to, to the power and the opportunity they have to engage the stakeholders directly, which are also corporate, which which might be policymakers um, directly, indirectly, or science journalists who can facilitate these conversations for, um, to, to get the information um, cross-sectoral and to cross-sectoral conversations. Um, and now I think it's a struggle. Yeah. I think it's a struggle for researchers because it depends on the place you're at. You you mm -hmm. have to get money. You have to keep it your job, right? You've got responsive personal responsibilities to yourself, your own health. You got responsibilities to your children, to your spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has this, uh, and they a lot of times have to just do what's necessary in order to keep their job. And so, a lot of what you can do depends on the place you're at, mm -hmm. right? Some places are going to be more. Uh, cooperative. Some countries are more cooperative. I think that th there's a lot more pressure in the U.S. to publish lots of papers and to to make it look like our university is the number one in the world. And uh, whereas in in maybe in in some universities in some countries there's there's more uh, involvement by by companies and more closer cooperation between the companies and the universities. So it depends. It depends on. The university, the country, the type of uh, type of ways you're 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 being measured, your work is being measured. Uh, mm -hmm. So it depends. I don't think there's a a simple rule. I think for a lot of people, though, you you already have a lot of stress. You already have a lot of stress trying to publish, and now you're trying to do something for uh, trying to make your research be you know work out well. Well, some people can do that, and uh, we we you see some like. Uh, Katarina Carrico and you see uh, Nobel Prize winners um, like uh, I forget who developed CRISPR, but she's she in her in her in her book she talks a lot about making use of this commercially CRISPR, 
uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge and there's some people who do this, but these are the stars, right? And in many of us aren't stars. Many of us are, are smart people. Almost everybody in universities are smart, but uh, even if you're in the top 0.1%, that doesn't mean you can do these things, right? You have to be in the 0.001% mm. uh, to do great things. Yeah, I also have the capacity to start with, like like you mentioned, um, to even think that far, and yeah, because like for all of us, we we all have the same amount of time available, and there's only so much capacity that's humanly possible to to leverage. Yeah. Um. What What do you think about open source and the 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 commons um concept? Open science. Do you, well, uh, open source in particular, so when it comes to te technology, do you believe that open source products are commercializable? I believe they are, but like from a corporate angle, there seems to be a lot of fear to embrace open source because then they might fear that you lose the unique selling point, Um, you know, to, to develop products by providing the code, providing the, the details. Um um yeah but but then how how can a company protect their unique selling point but also making the benefits that the product brings more widely applicable as we've had these discussions with with the vaccines um very um yeah uh, dominantly and then germany was was um uh, well, there's a number of issues here. I'm not, I, I couldn't hear you properly, so I don't know exactly what issues you were referring to, but there are a number of important. One is that mm -hmm. journals are very expensive and, uh, you know, so that's not accessible to everyone, which, which is a problem because if you're not working for a big company or big university, you may not have access to this research, even though your tax dollars paid for it. So there's this access to these, these journals that's important. So this movement, a open science, yeah, which open is for the most part yeah. good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the issue of, uh, you know, how many patents there are. There's so many patents. America has really increased the number of patents by at least six times in the past 40 years, uh, more than six times. Uh, and it means it's increasingly hard to do research if you don't have a lot of money. Um, so these are all issues. Um, and I agree that, you know, open science and, and things like this can are, are good ideas. Now, the problem is that we just have too many papers. So, uh, you know, what we really need to do is reduce the number of papers that we publish. We need to reduce the number of journals, reduce the requirement. We need to focus more on quality and not quantity and publishing less and better. Mm -hmm. uh, and But I don't know how to do that. I mean, it has to start with the funding agencies who who are, who are become more, con who should be more, more concerned with uh, making sure that new technologies that are coming out and that science is being done that can lead to those new technologies. So a lot of the responsibility I think is on the funding agencies because they have a lot of power, but a lot of, I'm not sure a lot of them want to, to think this broadly. Uh, and because, you know, if, if they, if they, if they, if they focus less on pap papers, it could be that the U S Congress will then call them up and say, Hey, what are you guys doing? You, you've funded all this research and you're hardly getting any papers out. Mm. All right. There's a lot of people in the system who have power, but they are so superficial in the way they they deal with the system. Right. And so somehow we have to overcome those kinds of problems. It's very hard to do. Uh, and of course, the the journals, they all want to make money. Right. They love more journals, more money. Uh, <laughs> they want more papers. It's all great for them. What could be a quality measure in the applied sciences world? Like how many, like do you, do you think the patent system as we have it still holds up with the current, where, where we at in society? Like with a 20 years ex expiration day, um, time? Well, I also think there's too many patents. We, you know, be, it, it's it's mostly the US government reduced the, the bar for novelty, began reducing the bar for novelty in the 1980s. Oh. Partly because okay. they're very concerned about competition from Japan, and they said, "Oh, oh. okay, and Asia, and oh, we're going to reduce this bar for novelty, uh, so we can patent everything and keep those foreigners from copying us." Mm. <laughs> but then like we, a, we not only made it hard for the foreigners to copy them, we made it hard for the the locals to copy them. Right? Oh. You just you just made you you just made all this business for for 
for uh, lawyers and for patent battles. And uh, mm -hmm. again, that doesn't help us. We don't need more patent battles. We need more products and services that make our lives better. Okay. So basically there's a redundancy of patents now or basically too many and too, when say low quality, but the novelty aspect is too low to be yeah. worth the patent. There are redundant patents, redundant papers. Yeah. Oh, okay. But but then if not the patents, what can be a good measure? Like how many startups um come out of academia or what could be a quality measure for applied research? Well, people universities use this measure of how many startups they, they created and they create mm -hmm. lots of them. The problem is they all lose money. Mm. Yeah, we want startups, successful startups. We we want startups that are successful. Startups that not only uh are created, they they release products. The products work well. The products make money. Uh, the startups then can survive for a long time. There's a whole set of things. The problem mm. is, is that there there is no good short term measure. Short, good short term measure. All the good metrics are long term. Right. We have, you know, people always talk about, oh, we got to think long term. Yeah, they're not thinking long term. Oh my gosh, they, they ended my project. Well, in reality, it's that somebody somebody came up with these short term metrics and they don't work well. Uh, and they don't want to get rid of them, um, but they don't work. Right. So we need to look at a decade worth of time to also set up an ecosystem and support system that helps the individuals to get to leverage through that time okay. and and move through academia, the startup incubator, okay. and then product development to survive five years of being on the market. Yeah. Well, there, there's no good short-term simple metrics, but the, yeah. but in the short term, it requires judgment, it requires very good judgment to be able to evaluate yeah. science and technology and progress. Of course, very good judgment and very few people have judgment. We put these short-term metrics in place that are mostly promoted and monitored and run by bureaucrats who don't have the ability to judge things. Yeah. Uh, complicated things it's very sad okay so if if we take us back to what you said like the suggestions so you you think we need uh like several consult every institution as an academic institution a consortium of experts from across the sectors uh, of society to to look at the like how can we how can we like what's a model that we can can set up and suggest to be implemented on institutional levels and maybe some I don't think there are some simple answers. I I think that that trying to get corporations to do more basic applied research uh is uh a move mm -hmm. in the right direction because corporations will be more concerned about funding and doing research that works well. I mean, you can just look at the replication rep, replication crisis, for instance. Academics don't care very much about it. Companies no. do, because companies want to create products. And they, get, they don't like it when they try to replicate some research results and they don't work. Mm. And they, they say, well, what can we believe? Yeah. Right? So they're concerned about this. To them, it's a much bigger issue than it is to academics, because academics are like, well, we're not measured by this. We're measured by how many papers we make. So we're going to do more papers. Um, so we need to change the dynamic. Uh, mm -hmm. And one way to change the dynamic is to give more support to companies to who, who are doing basic and applied research through what I call these cooperative uh, alliances. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what does a cooperative alliance look like? Well, they don't really exist right now because... Uh, you know, very little money is given to corporations except for contract research. Mm. Um, so I just give them as an example, um, there's, there may be better ideas, but the problem is you see that academics aren't looking at this. Mm. Economists and business school professors don't look at this. All they do is, is call patents and innovation and call papers science, and then they analyze the relationship between the two. They don't really look at whether new products and processes and services are actually coming out. Uh, and so there isn't a lot of people who are thinking about this. I mentioned one person, Ashish Yora at uh, Duke University, who's done some of this research, but he's in the minority and he doesn't do much of it. 
Mm. So the problem is we need a lot more academics to start thinking about this. And but, you know, all, all the, they're under the same publication pressures that the physicists, the chemists and the biologists are under. They have to publish papers and the papers that are published in top economic management journals use very sophisticated statistics to analyze patents and papers. Mm. So you see, it's very hard to solve the problem when everybody has decided that all we're going to do is do something that's superficial to get published. Yeah. I mean, there is now amongst the major funders in Europe, and I think also the US agreed that we need qualitative measures and get away from the impact factor, like the the, yeah. the quantitative one. But then how? Because research is so specific and like to, the, yeah. So it really it needs yeah. to not only on the institutional level, but it needs to be assessed on a on a project level. I would argue. Um, so it cannot be discipline cross cutting either, because every research project is so specific and so complex in its nature and setup and applicabilities that yeah. only there can you assess like yeah what are the potential benefits and but maybe there are some criteria that we can then again make measurable and and give points to. Which which mount up to yeah to a decision making um, factor of yeah this is worth funding and that's not I don't know <laughs> or well well every technology is different every technology is different every technology has a different set of performance measures so mm -hmm. for batteries we're mostly concerned about uh, energy storage density maybe power storage density maybe the cost. Uh, per that storage density. Uh, solar cells are concerned about uh, efficiency, but we may also be concerned about durability, longevity. Uh, for fusion, there's something called the triple product. Uh, so every one of these technologies has some set of measures. And I think that funding agencies need to think about those measures and how we can move technologies uh, uh, forward along these measures so that we're bringing the technologies closer to commercialization. Um, I, and I think that smart people can do that. The problem is, is that a lot of these funding agencies and a lot of managerial positions are filled with people who kind of believe in the, in metrics, right? There's a great book called The Tyranny of Metrics. It was written 20 years ago about how organizations move to implement all these metrics, many of which really don't help organizations because they're so narrow they're measuring people by such narrow things mm -hmm. you know it's not just researchers but everybody in organizations who suffer from this tyranny of metrics mm -hmm. um and so we need uh research bureaucrats research administrators research funding agencies to to think more deeply about the technology and how you measure progress in the technology and then look at whether research is is moving us down that that path of progress right yeah okay so we are in the midst of the reform we're on many angles but it looks like there is a need to and hopefully it's coming also together that all the the people who are discussing how we can reform the system that is academia towards um and that's the whole idea of open science to open up to society to make research societal beneficial again more so and i like it, it was mind blowing what you said in the beginning <laughs> like um again like how researchers are currently incapable of doing the research they sign up for um yeah but which which we are aware of in a way but then i think we touched on a few aspects that um are issues currently, but should and can be addressed and are probably already being addressed. So let's just keep the conversation going and and push for more of a coherent conversation and, and long-term um, planning okay. to, to facilitate the reform. Is there something else you would like to, to add to, to conclude? Um, no, I think I've said probably enough. <laughs> Well, there's always more to be said, but thank you so much for your time yeah. and and okay. appreciate um, also the efforts and, and your accomplishments that you've also um, had. Okay, well, thank you. I hope uh, some of the things I said were of use. I think so. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. I did. So I'll, I'll let you know the feedback and, and the continuous con continuation okay. where that's going.
Thanks. Okay.